Hello and welcome back to the RDF Tactics YouTube channel. Today we have another great football manager tactic to test out. It's a tactic based around the Red Bull philosophy. So we have rapid vertical attacks and energized pressing. Mainly based around Salzburg's 4-2-4, but it's not a replication, it's a tactic that is inspired by the Red Bull model. So I have tested it with two teams, one being a Red Bull team, RB Leipzig we did one test with, but also we tested it in Portugal with Vitoria Gimeres and it did very, very well. It absolutely did fantastic, smashing all expectations. Also for complete transparency, in the description there will be a link for the save. I've uploaded the save for anyone that wants to download it and check it out, of course, so the results are going to be there for you to download and also look at for yourselves as well. You can go into the games, you can also play some games yourself if you want to. So in this video we are going to analyse the Red Bull philosophy. In Football Manager we are going to create our own tactic based off that philosophy and then we are going to check the results. So before we get stuck in make sure you are subscribed to this YouTube channel that would mean a lot. Make sure you like this video as well that would help a lot and you can share it out that of course will help a lot as well. The Football Manager skin used in the video as well is by Presec. You can also download that in the description link but now let's get started please. A key aspect of how the Red Bull network of clubs look to play is vertically. The aim is to try and get the ball forward as quickly as possible. This is not aimless hoofing of the ball though, it's played in a very deliberate and planned manner. In the build up, Salzburg tried to ensure that they have a numerical superiority at all times. This was done by having one of the central midfielders drop deep to receive possession, often in the wide space, with the other midfielder staying high to offer a passing option. This could also have an effect of drawing the opposition out towards the drop in player, which, in turn, would open space up behind him for a pass to be played vertically into midfield. Here's an example of a midfielder dropping into the back line during the build up phase. Madi Kamara is the one who drops deep from midfield into the left back space, allowing the actual left back to push on. The Red Bull clubs look to play vertically at all times and you would often see players on the ball looking for a vertical passing option even from deeper areas. The aim is to go from back to front as quickly as possible to catch out the opponents and create goal scoring opportunities. A facet of Salzburg's play under March which allowed them to do this so well was in the positioning of the attacking midfielders. The wide midfielders would tuck in and play as two number 10s, hence the use of a 4-2-2-2, giving the Salzburg defenders multiple central passing options in between the opposition lines. This also helped create a box shape in midfield along with two central midfielders which again gave them a numerical superiority and also allowed for quick combinations to be played due to their proximity close to each other. We can see this sort of shape in the image, with the box also quite evident. And here, Salzburg were able to draw 6 Atletico players over to one side of the pitch, which opens up the switch from Repu to the left back Andreas Alma, who now has acres of space to bomb forward into. This is a perfect example of Salzburg's approach on the marsh, verticality, ball retention and switches of play. Another facet of his tenure can also be seen here. Salzburg usually cross low and hard from wide positions for runners into the box to be able to get onto and hit first time towards the goal. We have already seen how there are some positional rotations during the build up for Salzburg and this continues as they progress up the field as well, most notably with the two centre forwards. One of the two forwards will drop off the back line, looking to receive possession in between the lines while the other will attempt to run in behind and stretch play, also offering a potential forward passing option. This was the case even on occasions where Salzburg lined up with a lone striker, it would be the number 10 who would drop off in these instances. And finally, looking at another aspect of Salzburg's play on the march that allowed them to play vertical and quickly, playing vertical football constantly means that you usually need to have players close to each other when the first vertical pass is made to allow for quick combination play, otherwise the player receiving the ball will be isolated and possession will be lost quite easily. This example shows principles in action as Mwepu passes the ball forward here, Barisha has Dakar and Arison in close support. This allows for a quick exchange of passes between the two players, with Aronson peeling away to run in behind. But that there was the attacking principles, now we can look at the defensive principles arguably where the Red Bull teams are most impressive.
The Red Bull Network of clubs prioritise regaining the ball immediately after losing it with a high press and constant counter pressing. Ball orientation is the key tenor of this approach. Salzburg tend to overload the ball side with players to try and win it back, while we also saw this being used in possession to recycle possession before a vertical pass is made. When Salzburg lose the ball, they tend to counter press immediately and with energy. While multiple players will press the man in possession, others will stick tight to a potential passing option with the aim of either getting ahead of them to intercept the pass or preventing them from turning to play a pass forwards and forcing them wide or backwards. Note how there are at least two Salzburg players immediately pressing the Atletico man in possession while the centre back steps up and stays tight to Luis Suarez to ensure that he cannot receive possession easily. The tendency to press the ball processor with multiple players also allows you to win the ball back even if the first player is bypassed. And here is a pretty typical example of how a Salzburg team will look at an opposition goal kick. Salzburg stay narrow with two number 10 staying in a half space to create a numerical overload in central areas and make it difficult for the opposition to play through them centrally. When the ball is played out to the left side of centre back, Salzburg's press is activated. The right side of the striker leads the press, being near the ball, with the two central midfielders also moving across to maintain compactness, along with the 10 on the far side. The 10 on the near side stays ready to sprint across and press the left back with Salzburg baiting the opposition into playing the ball to him. They pay no attention to the players on the opposition's right side and this is what we mean by ball oriented. When the ball does get played to the left back, the press intensifies. The striker presses the left back from behind while also cutting off a return pass to the left side of the centre back, with the 10 having come across as well to create a 2v1 in this area. The left winger is being tracked closely by the Salzburg right back to roll him out as a passing option as well, while the two central midfielders have also pushed up to cut off central passing options. The right side of the striker is blocking a switch to the goalkeeper or the other centre back as well and thus, and thus, Salzburg would almost certainly end up winning the ball high up the pitch here, with players around the ball to play quickly and advance into the box. Aggressive pressing and counter pressing in a ball orientated manner with central compactness and overloads is an accurate summary of the Red Bull's approach of the ball. But that there wraps up the tactical analysis, we are now going to go into Football Manager to check out the tactic and the results of course, so now let's head over. So here we are in Football Manager and don't forget the skin is created by Presec, the link will be in the description below. A big shout out to Presec, also check out his YouTube channel as well, a good friend of mine within the Football Manager community and this is just a shout out for all the hard work that he's done. So here we are with the RDS March inspired 442, we could have called it a Red Bull tactic, I'm not sure why I didn't call it the Red Bull tactic but here we are, it's a 442, and also quickly before we talk about the tactic, if you look over to the right here, you will see that pretty much every single player was used during the season. A lot of people ask me how my players aren't tired, and it's because I like to rotate. Now, Vittoria aren't even in Europe, but I still found the need to rotate my players, and you can see that over here as well. Not a single player has played over probably 35 games here, and also with a few backup players in double figures of appearances. <laughs> so now I'm done with that quick tip, let's talk about the tactic. For the mentality, we are using attacking. It aims to overload in the final third by employing a much faster tempo to create an attacking orientated direct patterns of play where recycling possession will be used as a tool to penetrate the opposition from another area and that is exactly, almost exactly what we want. We want to overload certainly in these areas and we also want to focus on getting the players forward as well as the ball. For the instructions, we are using a standard attacking width, by default it would be fairly wide, which will be getting our passes out into the wider areas, but that's something that we don't really want. We want to use vertical passing, but at the same time not let it be exclusive. So this way I found it was best also with the player roles as well, which is also going to influence the passing directions. For the approach play, we are going to be playing out from the defence with a slightly shorter passing and a higher tempo. And in the final third, the only instruction there is to whip our crosses into the box. So we aren't overloaded with instructions and I actually felt that suited this tactic perfectly. 
In transition, when the possession has been lost, of course, we are going to counter press and when the possession has been won, we are then going to be making our counter movement. When we are out of possession, we are using a much higher line of engagement to try and win the ball back as high as possible with a high defensive line. We are going to be using an offside trap, I felt that was vital with this tactic, a sweeper keeper is also going to help us with that and for the pressing intensity we are using extremely urgent preventing the short goalkeeper distribution as well. So now for the player roles, we are using a sweeper keeper on support. So just like I said, the sweeper keeper will help us with our offside trap and a high defensive line. If the opposition do beat our press and our offside trap, we can also rely on our sweeper keeper to sweep things up. He can also help us with our build up play from the back as well. In central defence, we have a nice mix of a ball playing defender and a central defender. The ball playing defender may be key in breaking lines from deeper areas as well. So if you want to emphasise on that, you can select two ball playing defenders. But I do also like a little bit of safe play and circulating possession at the back, which is why I also went with one central defender. For the fullback positions, we are using the fullback on the supportive duty. They're instructed to cross less often, cross from the byline, cross into the centre, shoot less often and mark tighter. With the support duty, the fullback will support the midfield by providing extra width and will look for crosses, which hopefully will be down the byline and through balls, which hopefully they will aim their through balls into the central areas, mainly looking for the inverted wingers or the false nine and advance forward. The right back is the exact same as the left back. In central midfield, we are using a deep line playmaker. The only instruction he has is to mark tighter. When we are building up, of course, he's going to be key. He's going to drop deep and he's going to be setting our tempo as well. With the support duty, he will bring the ball out from the defence and operate with a more expansive passing range. Hopefully, again, this can help us break some lines in central midfield. His midfield partner is a central midfielder on the attacking duty, he is also instructed to mark tighter. With the attacking duty, of course the central midfielder is going to look to break forward and this will complement the false nine. When the false nine drops deep to collect the ball, we will then have our central midfielder on the attacking duty making an overlapping run and that can help us exploit space. If the false nine drops deep and the central defender follows, then the central midfielder has a lot of area to attack. On the flanks we have two inverted wingers, they are instructed to cross aim into the centre and mark tighter. The one on the left has an attacking duty, he's going to be more direct with his running, running at the defenders and the one on the right has a supportive duty. He's of course going to support play a little bit better but also he's mainly going to help overload in those central areas. Up top we have a false nine which everybody knows by now what a false nine does. He's going to drop deep especially in those attacking midfield areas and this can help create gaps and space if a defender follows. Our advanced forward can benefit from this and also our central midfielder on the attacking duty. Lastly up top we do have an advanced forward, he has no added instructions and again we all know what the advanced forward does. He's going to stretch play but mainly going to be our main goal scorer. Now if you look at these player roles, a lot of them are going to influence the centre of the pitch which is going to be helping us with our vertical play. We know that the inverted wingers are going to operate in central areas, the deep line playmaker is going to drop deep centrally and the central midfielder is going to run forward in central areas as well. The false nine is going to drop deep mainly in the opponent's defensive midfield area, again a little central and so to the advanced forward. The advanced forward may move out wide to move into channels or to chase a through ball but mainly he's going to operate and try to goal score in those central areas. But that there wraps up the tactic, we are now going to check out the results. First, we are going to check out with Vittoria because for me, that is the most, most impressive results. I actually can't believe the results myself. Again, you can download the save, it is going to be in the description but now, let's check the results. So firstly we're going to look at their media prediction and as you can see on the screen they are predicted to finish 5th in the Portuguese top tier. So now when we look at the Premier League table you can see that why it's so impressive that Vitoria managed to win the Portuguese league. We finished top, we played 34, we won 26, drawing 4 and losing 4. Ended up with the best goal difference in the league and the points tally of 82. Three of those four losses came away, two of those were 4-2 defeats away to Porto and Benfica. We also lost 2 now at home to Boa Vista and also a 1-0 loss away to Porto Menize and I hope I pronounced that right. <laughs> 
In the touch of the Portugal placard, again, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, we got knocked out in the fifth round by Farinese, but in the Allianz Cup, we reached the final, which was expected actually, and we won that trophy. So in the league, we managed to score 90 goals. Bear in mind, we were predicted to finish fifth and we ended up scoring 90 goals, by far the most in the league. And we had also the best defence in the league as well. We only conceded 30 goals, most of them being against Porto and Benfica. So as you can see here, we scored the most goals, we had the most points per game, we had the most shots for as well. For the fewest shots against, we actually came fourth, but we don't have the best defence, so really we aren't expecting to be number one in that regard. For the best pass completion, we came in seventh. For the most possession, we came in fourth with 54%, which is nice. For the most tackles won, we aren't in the top eight. For the most dribbles made, we came in second with 102. For the most clean sheets, we had the most clean sheets, and for the fewest conceded, we've conceded the fewest. When looking at the goal scoring opportunities for the expected goals for, we topped that table with 72.64 and for the clear cut chances if I can find it, we came in fourth with 28 clear cut chances created. For the player stats we done excellent as well, we have this Colombian striker, again I don't know his first, I don't know how to pronounce his name, I'm just going to call him Oscar, he managed to score 32 goals in 30 games, yes absolutely amazing. But as we can see, Marcus Edwards also scored 15 goals on the right side of midfield. And we have Bruno Duarte, who scored 15 goals as well as our false nine striker. For the most assists, we have Ricardo Cuesma with 15, Andre Andre with 9. For the most shots, it's our striker. And for the most man of the match awards, is Oscar again. For the most key passes, we have Ricardo Cuesma in 4th place. For the best pass completion, we have... What's his name? Abdul Moomin. We have Abdul Moomin on 96%. For the most tackles won, we have nobody in the top eight. For the most dribbles made, we have Marcus Edwards, which is no surprise. If you look at his attributes, it's absolutely ridiculous. Agility 17, balance 16, first touch 16, dribbling 17, flair 17, composure 16. He likes to try his tricks. Absolutely amazing player on Football Manager. For the most clean sheets, we have our goalkeeper Bruno Varela with, seven, with 17, sorry. And for the least conceded, we have Bruno Varela with 30, but he played every single game, unlike the other goalkeepers above him. Now to look at our attacking efficiency, you can see that we were aggressive and clinical, we managed more shots per match than average, and we were more clinical than a lot of sides in the league. With the general performance, you can see that we pretty much outperformed the average in every aspect. Now for our defensive efficiency, we were quiet and impenetrable, we faced fewer shots per game than average and we conceded fewer goals than what would be expected from the number of shots that we faced. But how did we score most of our goals? 52 from play shots, 16 from powerful shots and most of the assists came from through balls, 10 from the opposition mistake which is highly impressive, that means our pressing, pressing, pressing is working and 11 from crosses. We only scored one from corner, there is no corner routine set in this tactic as well so if you know a good one, make sure you set it up. Now for the squad stats, our striker scored 34 goals in all competitions in 32 games, Marcus Edwards scored 16 in 32 and Bruno Duarte, our false 9, scored 16 in 31. For the most creative players, we have Ricardo Cuesma with 15, we have Andre Andre on 9, we have Andre Almada on 7, but as you can see, this was a team effort. Pretty much everybody got an assist right through our team, probably apart from our centre-backs and our goalkeeper. But that there wraps up the results for Vittoria, we're now going to go to RB Leipzig, which again, a very, very surprising result. So, let's head over. And here we are at RB Leipzig. As you can see in the Bundesliga, we won the league again, playing 34, winning 28, but we drew 6, lost no games at all. The point difference between the two teams in first and second, RB Leipzig and Bayern Munich, was 20 points. Absolutely ridiculous. You can see that our two strikers at the bottom scored equal amount of goals, 17. In the Champions League, we got knocked out in the quarter-final by Benfica, which is kind of disappointing and in the DFB Pokal we got knocked out in the quarter final by Bayern Munich. And you can see at RB Leipzig we got some impressive results. We started off with some high scoring games 4-0, 4-1, beat Augsburg 4-2, beat Zenit 5-1 but my most impressive result probably in both tests was against Barcelona away at the new Camp. We managed to beat them 3-1, Yusuf Poulsen getting two and Justin Kluivert scoring just before half time. 
Another impressive result was away to Bayern Munich where we beat them 3-2. They did score a penalty but we scored a late winner in the 88th minute. We also have a 6-1 victory here against Freiburg as well. A 5-0 win against FC Cologne. A 5-1 win against Augsburg. We got to the knockout stages where we beat Juve. Well, we knocked Juve out. But disappointingly, we got smashed 4-0 away to Benfica. We did beat them at home 2-0, but it just wasn't enough. We beat Werder Bremen 5-0 and we beat Wolfsburg 4-0 as well, before beating Dortmund 4-2 away. But enough of that, let's look at the Bundesliga. So we had the highest points per game, we scored the most goals, we had the most shots for, not the fewest shots against again, but we came in second for the best pass completion, not in the top eight. For the most possession we have 52% so similar to 54 that we got at Vittoria. For the tackles one we have nothing in the top 8. For the dribbles we made we come in 3rd almost again similar to Vittoria with 109. We have the most clean sheets 20 and the fewest conceded 21 so again we had the best defence. For the most goals we had Erling Haaland on 33 which obviously isn't an RB Leipzig player. We have Yusuf Poulsen on 17 and Sherlock on 17 as well. For the most assists, we have Yusuf Poulsen, highly impressive player. He got 13 assists, Danny Almo got 9, Kevin Campbell got 9 as well. For the most shots, Serloff is there. For the most player of the match awards, we have Yusuf Poulsen on 6. We also have He Chan as well on 5. For the most key passes, Danny Almo on 105. Best pass completion, nobody in the top 8. For the most tackles won, again, nobody in the top 8. But for the most dribbles made, we have Justin Cliver on 30. So... Of course, as you can see from both tests, it's vital to have a very good dribbler on your side. For the most clean sheets, we have our goalkeeper on 19 and for the fewest conceded, our goalkeeper is there on 21. He should be number one. These guys only played 15 and 18 games respectively. In the squad, who are the top goal scorers? We have Sherlock on 22, Paulson on 20, He Chan on 14, Sabitza on 13 and Justin Cliver on 12. For the most assists, we have Yusuf Paulson on 15 and Danny Almo on 10. Again, it's a team effort. Pretty much everybody got an assist or two even, indicating a very good team spirit within this tactic and team. But unfortunately, that wraps up this video. I hope you guys have enjoyed it. My name is RDF. Don't forget, if you are new or you haven't yet, hit the subscribe button, like this video and share it most importantly. Peace out, have a nice day and stay safe. See ya.